Good evening. Happy August. Happy August, everyone. It is mongoose time. Woohoo! Something I never thought I'd say before. I'm just checking to see if Keith is coming. He had to work late today. So, um, as you guys are joining us, I'm just going to get set up a little. All right. Oh, all right. Four people on. Hi, Mar. Welcome. All right. I'm just going to go shut my other computer off. Right, sorry for the delay. I only see Marla, I see a bunch of people on and only Marla has commented. So anybody who uh, wants to join in and or who's watching, um, welcome. And um, usually uh, when people join, I can see them on their comments. However, um, I only see Marla, but I see that I have a bunch of other people watching. So um, anyway, welcome. I am just um, getting started getting set up and we are tasting mandus tonight. So if you do not have mandus, we will be talking about it. I'm going to say the word so many times. I don't think I've ever said it. Hi, Mary. Welcome. Hi, Greer. Um, I don't think I've ever said the word before I tasted the wine and now I can't stop saying it. So I'm excited to share the mandus with you. We're also going to be playing a little bit with my card game tonight and um, trying to um, play with the tasting notes and get you um, help you kind of narrow down what you're tasting, putting words on it. When we go through a tasting, oftentimes um, it's, it's really fast, right? I taste blackberry, I taste blueberry, I taste whatever it is. And um, I really want to get you to slow down tonight. So we're going to play two truths and a lie with my card game in just a little bit. So that should be fun. Hi, Chris, top fan, top fan, welcome. And I know quite a few people are on vacation. Hi, Leslie. Welcome. Happy Thursday. I have to tell you, I was thinking about preparation for today. And sometimes I kind of get around, you know, nervous, run around, trying to get it all organized and ready. And this week I was just like, oh, dude, it's Mondo's. <laughs> it's just such a beautiful varietal, something most of you have probably never heard of. But not only that, I was really excited to talk with you guys and see you all online. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Whatever you're drinking is fine, as long as it's not like, you know, ethyl alcohol. Whatever wine you are drinking, um, how did, Chris, how did you lose your top fan moniker? Don't worry, I'm going to send you something, it'll make you happy. Um, and Mar, I really wish you could put the comment that you and I talked about with, um, Marla has a really good um, little icon that she puts up that's really kind of funny. So if you can figure that out, Mar, please put it up. Anyway, um, okay, so let's let's begin, all right, as people join. Um, so it's been an interesting few weeks, and things in the wine world are ever-changing. So today I um, went, or I was reading about how um, the U.S. recommendations by the health organization were to have less wine, that Americans need to, to drink less wine, but not just Americans men need to drink less wine. So I just find it fascinating, but I guess they didn't look at a lot of the science. They looked at particular science. And so uh, the wine and uh, distilling industry, they're kind of uh, fighting back and asking them to look at some of the benefits, the stress relief, they call it the French paradox and how healthy French people are. But the recommendation is one glass for, for women, two glasses for men a day. Um, and I guess if you add it all up and you're, you know, drinking it all in one night, like we are, you know, it's, it balances out. So anyway, um, kind of interesting and so, but tasting rooms are struggling in California. I've never done the news before in the wine world. I just thought it's kind of interesting that, um, but what I wanted to share with you is tasting rooms in your favorite wineries. They're not getting a lot of foot traffic, which you, you know, probably isn't surprising. And so what, um, what what I want to suggest is if you have a favorite vintner, like one of my favorite vintners is doing virtual tastings. And so you can order um, five or six bottles and the winemaker or the owner does a virtual tasting with you or whatever group that you do it with. So just it's a fantastic opportunity while we're still um, dealing with the pandemic. So I just want to kind of 
um, suggest, and I'm more than happy to help you find a great winery to do that with. But if you ha do have a favorite one, they would definitely appreciate um, having the business, okay? Aside from Artisan Wine Group. All right, so tonight we're learning about, as Chris calls it, mongoose. It's called mongoose, M-O-N-D-E-U-S-E. <laughs> right, Chris, a bottle a day. Yeah, we're talking a drink a day, a drink a day, but yes. Um, so most of you probably have never heard of mongoose and you're, most of you, if you didn't order the tasting pack, were probably unable to find it in your local store. I know Marla, who's kind of like my second in command over there, she goes and she goes to certain stores and she does my recon. And so her store had one, uh, one bottle. She said, Mondeuse, and the woman said, no, I don't think so. And then she went and looked and sure enough, they had one bottle of Mondeuse. So um, it's kind of interesting um, that she was able to find it. I didn't check the New Hampshire liquor store tonight. I'm not sure if they will have any or not. It would be curious. I'd be curious to see. So I was actually looking for Gamay. So I had sent to my distributor uh, a, a, a request for, um, a, or to the winery, for a sample pack. And there were a couple that sounded interesting. So I thought, you know, I'd really like to have Gamay in the lineup because Gamay is, can be a really wonderful summer wine. I've, there's Beaujolais that's made of Gamay, and that is very fruit forward. Hi, Keith. Um, and so there's Beaujolais that's made with Gamay and Beaujolais Nouveau. It's very kind of light bubblegum cherry, okay? But the way it's made, it really does have bubblegum smells and tastes to it. Um, but it's, and I was looking for something like that, but I've had, um, 90 Plus had a, a Chanasse, which is a Gamay varietal, and um, it's phenomenal. So I was looking for a Gamay like that, and unfortunately I didn't find that. But what I did find is this Mondeuse. And I love the label, so sexy. And then, yeah, the, Keith is just looking at it. And the varietal itself, it's it's very small production, but sommeliers love it, and you're going to find out why. Oh, and T Total Wine has their inventory by store online. Yeah, so Chris, if you have a chance and want to flip over, take a look and see if they have mandus. I would be surprised if they did, but they might. Yeah, neat. Um, so... Um, I love, as you know, I love stories. I love new and different wines and wines that teach us something, but it's also really important to me that the wines have depth. Hi, Christine and Denise, welcome. Um, Christine is our is our traveler. She's She's been out and about and uh, joining us from a different location, undercover uh, with her sister. So I'm glad that you are able to make it. Um, but something I look for in the wines that I choose is always the different, the story, the handcrafted, if it's organic, sustainable, love that. Um, but I also look for depth, meaning when you drink it, it has, it has um, a longer, um, it's on your palate longer, it lasts longer, and also it's a good food wine. To me, that's what a fine wine is, and that's what I'm always looking for in the varietals or in the wines that I choose. And so this Mandus has a great story, and um, it's, it's a really, really cool wine. And as little supply as there is of Mandus, the buzz about or around sommeliers is, um, is, is huge. They love to put mandus on their tasting list because it's interesting, it's complex, it's a good food wine, and in general, people really like it. So it's pretty enjoyable. So that is what we are doing tonight. We are mandusing. Uh, maybe we can make that a word, mandusing. Leslie looked on the New Hampshire liquor store, then there is none. Okay, so there's none listed. Thank you for checking. Yeah, interesting. All right, drinking game of the night. Drinking game of the night is Savoir, if I say Savoir. Now my challenge to you is, can you spell it? So in comments, see who can spell Savoir. Savoir Fair is everywhere. Savoir Fair, yeah, what does that even mean? Savoir Fair is everywhere. Is that like a, a style for thing, Savoir? I don't know, was it? Yes. All right, who knows the cartoon Keith's talking about, the Sa Savoir Fair. All right, so drinking game of the night, Savoir. Marla loves hers, but nobody has tried to spell Savoir. So let's let's see. Can anybody spell it? <laughs> All right. While while you guys are trying to spell the it, I'll spell it at the end. Act or speak in appropriately in social situations. That's is savoir faire? Savoir faire is. is the ability to spack, speak, which I'm not doing, or react, react or act, or act in a social situation. Appropriate, appropriate social situation. So that that's interesting. Pepe Le Pew says, "Chris, is yes. that what it's from?" Yes, I think so. he's right. He's right. All right. So basic facts on Mandu, serve it at 57 degrees. So if you are, or was it underdog? Leslie wants to know underdog. Savoir faire. All right, Keith, we'll get um, back to us. I love Pepe. Klondike Cat? 
Klondike cat, Keith says. No. Okay, so oh. Greer gave it a chance. Savior. Save Greer yeah. with Klondike your Canadian. Wow. Um, oh, Mary says Klondike cat. Yeah. Oh, oh. Was Klondike cat part of Underdog, though, maybe? Yes, All right, yes. anyway. Enough on the cartoons. Um, so Greer, thank you for trying to spell Savoir. Um, and actually I will spell it in the comments, but it also can be spell, spe um, spelled like this. So Savoir, oh, and I keep saying it, it's a drinking word. You guys, two drinks, two sips. Cheers to all of you. Remember we're drinking, we're not really tasting yet. Okay. Um, hi, Lori. Welcome. I'm just glad you're here. Um, and then we're talking about the spelling of Savoie, which happens to be the drinking game. So the second spelling is S-O-V-O-Y. And a lot of people will see that and say Sav Sav Savoy, but it's supposed to be Savoie. Okay. Uh, Greer, you keep saying savior. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that might be your spell check. All right, so it's served at 57 degrees. So if it's warm, you're not gonna get the same tastes, okay? Um, it's supposed to be slightly chilled. Remember, homes, when they set um, the tasting, um, when they say room temperature, homes used to be 60 degrees, 65 degrees. Um, and so you do have to do a slight chill. So those of you who bought the tasting pack, um, I had sent an email out saying, throw it into the fridge, um, for an hour or two beforehand so you can chill it and I can tell mine is a perfect chill I didn't take the temperature, but I pulled it from the fridge. I had had mine in the fridge um, And pulled it and I'm not gonna hold it like this because it's gonna get too warm Okay, so I'm gonna hold it by the stem so it doesn't get get too warm while we're tasting All right Greer darn spell check. Yes, but I appreciate I definitely appreciate the effort Peppery, yes, it's definitely peppery. All right, you drink it in a big glass. As you can see, my big burgundy glass. Um, the region is essentially in the Alps. It's really close to Geneva, Switzerland, and actually Geneva's at the at the north end. So it's kind of, um, it's, it's, in, it's an interesting region. Um, Imbibe Magazine calls it a flavor to watch. Really great and approachable price points on Mondus. And you get everything that we talked about, the fruit, the acid, the juicy, the fresh, um, and it's one of the most delicious and crowd pleasing red wines. So um, it has the juiciness and the brightness of a Beaujolais, but the spiciness of a Syrah. And if you like a Gamay or a Syrah, one sommelier says this was like a rustic love child of the two, of Gamay and Syrah. So picture what you will, rustic love child, that's where you get that peppery. But it also has the spiciness of Cap Franc. Okay, a uh, big part of its appeal, as I said before, affordable price point, anywhere from 14 to $50. And um, it, it's beautiful, exuberant, and the nose is incredible. And it actually can age, it can age very well. Um, five to six years, one, one um, thing I looked up said 10 years, so 12 years. And it's starting to pop up on wine lists in New York and a few other cities, but it's still new for many people. So you are now going to go into fine dining restaurants and you're going to see Mondus and you might order it and the, they will be very impressed. All right, <laughs> Laura. Yeah. Interesting about Geneva. Isn't that crazy? Um, there it's, it's really, um, they're calling it an up and coming region. Savoir drink. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. But there's another word for mandus in Geneva, and I'm going to cover that after. So when you go next time, you're going to have to, to go for to take a look. All right. Tasting. We're going to taste. All right. The first thing we want to do is look at the color. Now we're going to, I'm just warning you, we're going to play a game. Okay. So first we're going to do the color. So we do the color. You hold it up against your white piece of paper. What color is that? Those of you who are drinking Gamay, yours is probably a little redder. Those of you who are drinking, I don't know, Pinot Noir, it's probably, uh, well, it's probably lighter. Okay. What color would you call this? Black. Do, do, licorice. Do, do. I get advice that I have to wait longer. Licorice. For comments. And licorice. I'm not as patient. Keith calls it licorice. So is that black? Looks like a black licorice. Hmm. Uh, uh, eh. Bringing out a new word. All right. We're going to call it purple. Licorice. Purple tinge, they say in the reviews, but that is not a purple tinge. That is dark, opaque, purple. Big, yes, Leslie, deep purple. Top fan. Uh, Savoie. 
Cheers. Okay, here's the game. So we do smell and we do taste, right? So I'm not going to have you, Marla. Yep, here they come. Plum, dark purple, almost brownish. Yeah, deep maroon tones. And Greer says a burgundy color. Yes. All right. Now we're going to do the smell and taste, but I don't want to ask you to um, to call them out. Okay. So we're going to smell it, then we're going to taste it, and then your brain. I just want you to think. Okay, what are we experiencing? All right. So we're going to do the swirl and the smell for your aroma. Stick your nose in there. Okay, and again, don't say it, don't type it in, just think, what does that smell like? Oh, so good. <laughs> now you can probably see why when I tasted this, it would, it just blew me away. Keith, what do you think? Does it blow you away? Don't identify. Okay, now we're gonna taste it. All right, so remember, whatever you've been eating, whatever it is, you're gonna take a little sip, you're gonna move it around your mouth, you're gonna swallow it, then you're gonna take a second sip. And then you're going to try to identify it just in your mind, not to me. Mm. Okay. So I'm tasting it. I'm tasting it. Longevity on the palate. Bright, bright notes. Oh, so good. I can't wait to do this. Okay. So this is my card game. My card game is made up of cards that have big, bright, beautiful colors and descriptions. Okay. So we're going to play two truths and a lie. So what I'd like to ask you to do is I'm going to show you three tasting cards and I want you to comment which of those tasting cards match what you just smelled and taste, assuming that you're drinking mandus. Okay. All right. We have grass. We have strawberry. And we have black cherries. Okay. Two truths and a lie. Which two match and which is the one that does not match? I think I gave you an easy one. Okay. And those of you who have the game, you're going to see that it starts to have a theme. Like this is going to kind of tell you what these cards mean. And if you don't know what to do with my card game, I'm actually putting out um, a, a less expensive version in the next couple of weeks, but I used it at a, a big uh, 30 plus person party and I had people up and around and they were learning and they were playing these games. There's so many games you can play memory. You can play, um, I can't remember. No, there are 20 <laughs> plus games you can play war spit solitaire. Um, but it's all to help teach you about wine in a fun way. Okay. Marla says black cherries, strawberries match. Grass does not. Leslie mm -hmm. says grass and cherries. Yeah. Okay. Who else? Anyone else want to put yourself out there? Strawberries. All right. No more coming in. So Marla is correct. You've got the red fruit, the strawberry. You've got the black cherry, definitely black fruit. So red and black fruit. And Leslie, I'm so glad that you put yourself out there and said grass because the grass that you're tasting, and this is how it helps everybody. Because some people might say, okay, well, what does that grass taste? And it's earthy, right? It's, it's that earth that you're tasting. And so we call it earth. Um, and there's almost a tinge to it that's acidity. Okay. So tell Leslie, tell me if I'm right. If those words are a better match, the way I know it's not grass is grass is typically a white wine. All right. Let's try another. Uh, that might be too easy, but that's okay. All right. Now that won't, this will be hard. Wet stones, red cherries, nutty. Okay. Let's go back and taste it. Wet stones, red cherries, and nutty. Keep we need music. Do, 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 do. <laughs> need better music. Red, red wine. Yeah, Leslie definitely could be the acid. Hi, Mayor. Are you popping in and out? Oh, Kathy. Hi, Kathleen. How are you? All right. Greer has an oh darn. I don't know what that is. All right. Any guesses? Anybody want to put themselves out there? All right. Well, wet, nutty stone. <laughs> Thank you, Chris Westberg. <laughs> 
<laughs> he couldn't resist. Marla has red, red uh, wet stones and red cherries, and she doesn't have the nuts. And Leslie says wet stone and cherry. Anyone else? I'll tell you, Chris Westbrook is not right. <laughs> All right, so you can deduce that it's red cherries and it's nuts, okay? So that wet stone part is minerality and acidity, okay? So just to help, and I didn't see Greer's comment, but so at, what we're doing is as you're tasting with me, I'm not a pro, well, I guess I am a professional taster. The more we taste together, the more... Um, the um, the cards the girls must be streaming. It's going in and out. Um, the, <laughs> the the more that we taste together, the more you get the right words for what you're experiencing. So definitely cherries, definitely nuts. That so, wet stone, it could be earth, it could be the acidity. Should I be able to eat them with mixed nuts and get something out of it? Um, so Keith is asking, should he be able to eat mixed nuts? We have like this this thing of mixed nuts. And, and get something out of it, honey. It's definitely good. It tastes good. But what he's saying is, can I pull the nuts out of it? <laughs> okay. No, he's not. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> it is, Mary. It definitely is. Um, okay, so basically what he's asking is, you know the exercise I've done in the past where if you, you want to experience what oregano is in the wine, you pour a wet oregano into a little bit of the wine and then smell and taste it. So if Keith, if you wanted to pour a little bit, which I don't kind of don't want you to do with this wine. But if you wanted to pour a little bit into a glass, actually you could use one of the wines that's open in the fridge. And because it doesn't matter if it's the same wine or not. It's just wine itself with the alcohol. If you want to ground up some nuts and put them in it, you might get that nutty taste. And then you go back and taste your wine. That was fast and that's a lot. So I, if you have questions on that, just have me go back, okay? So if you were at one of my parties and we were doing this and wet stones came up, I may give it to you because I get I get what you're saying. It's that minerality, but it's and it is the the region is very much limestone, and so the wet stones is kind of like a half a yes rather than a whole. <laughs> Kid, please don't pull your nuts out. All right, so one last one. Okay, hmm. Let's see. Um, yeah, here's what we're gonna do. Ready? Violet. Red plums or peach? Violet, red plums, or peach? Um, and while you are answering that one, I just want you to know this is not the X-rated version, but I do think we need a cheers to Savoie. And those of you who haven't joined us before, <laughs> those of you who haven't joined us before, we do a little bit of a drinking game where if we say a specific word for the night, which Savoie is the word, we do a cheers and we drink. However, we learned today that the US um, Department of, I don't know, health would not support the drinking part. They would want us to taste. All right, let's see, we got um, violet and red plum, no peach, says Marla. Violet and plum, says Greer. Anyone else? All right, they are correct. So it's violet, which you often will find in red wines. Oops, and red plums. It could have been black plums too, but it's definitely plummy. And then nectarine or peach was incorrect. You often find peach in white wines. I can't think of a red wine that has peach, okay? That's a stone fruit, peach, nectarine, not in red wines, all right? Yes, definitely. Great job, guys. Hi, Andy, nice to see you. Playing a little bit with my card game. All right, so you get, you get a kind of a sense of how the card game is used. And those of you who have purchased it, if you um, want ideas for games, I know I need to do a game night, um, but, um, but definitely we are going to, um, to talk more about or to use my game more. All right, so we're doing the tasting. Andy, we're just jumping into the tasting. You've missed the basic facts on Mondu's, but we're gonna cover a whole lot depending on how the time goes. And just a reminder, those of you who aren't drinking Mondu's, enjoy whatever you're drinking and just listen along because it's a cool, it's a really, really cool uh, small production um, varietal, all right? So the aroma, so it's intensely aromatic, okay? Let's go ahead and smell it. I know we've already done it, but we're gonna go back and just cover the notes. So it's a mixture of red fruit. 
It's pepper. Greer called out the pepper earlier. I've actually, the one that I'm drinking is white pepper. It's a little bit less um, powerful than the black pepper. And then spices and floral. Okay, so you can, how do we know it's aromatic? What's an aromatic wine? If you swirl it and smell, you pick up some big, powerful aromas. There are some wines that you smell and there's not really aroma, there's not a, an outstanding aroma. So this one I would call aromatic, okay? And the reason is, is because it's from a region in the Alps, all of those wines are gonna be aromatic because it's a cold region. It's part of it, there's a lot to it. Um, and it's the, it's the varietal. So tasting, here's what you could have tasted, okay? And feel free to call them out in comments, aside from the ones that I already gave you with the card game. Okay, dark cherry, red cherry, spiciness, mild tannins, not a big tannin, it's mild tannins, firm acidity, and that's what Greer and Leslie were tasting when they got the grass. Um, hints of white pepper, dark plum. It can be, depending on the one you have, it can have a bitter cherry bite. And then you get the clo cloves, you get the nuts, you might get honey. The flavors can range from red fruits like strawberry, red currant, raspberry, sour plum, and flowers like violet to gamey overtones. And I almost pulled out um, my gamey card with the, the barnyard animals laying down um, because it definitely, I don't have a lot that, or I don't often have the farmyard option, <laughs> but tonight I could have pulled the farmyard, which, and, and it, do, it can smell or taste like farmyard, okay, which is that earth again. So, um, Oftentimes, um, the wines are described as being alpine, distinctly alpine, which means fresh and minerally, okay? So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just show you what I'm drinking and tell you a little bit about it, and then we'll hop to the to Savoie. So cheers, have a drink, we're talking about Savoie. This is Vin, du, uh, Vin de Savoie from the Savoie region in France, and it's called the Rhone Alps, that region. And this is the interesting, we know it's Mondu, so we can drink. Um, so a little bit about the wine. It's um, Domain Jean-Charles Gerard Madou. Okay. And for any of you who are French speakers, I apologize ahead of time at my accent. He founded the winery in 2006 in Savoie after repurchasing purchasing the vineyard. So the vineyards were in his family for generations and his grandfather ended up selling it. And so he basically bought it again. It was sold in 1976, but he went to school in Bonn bon. and Bonn and, um, and then he apprenticed under a top winemaker and he found that he really loved it. So he went back and bought the vineyards that his grandfather had owned, which is so cool. Um, and so um, he expanded it from two and a half hectares. I have no idea how big hectares are to six and a half hectares. And he does, he grows a whole bunch of grape varietals. Jacquere is the white varietal that's really big in that region. Again, a lot of them don't make it out into the US. Uh, Roussan and Gamay and then the Mondus. okay? So 50 year old vines, and I love how they say they're perched on vertiginous or vertiginous slopes, which means, does anybody know what vertiginous means? Vertiginous. All right, well, I'm gonna leave you with One that for a minute. Is 107,639 square feet. Okay, so small amount of square feet. Um, so Marla's getting violets, Marla olives, vanilla, feet. cloves. One big taste was very tart berry, but um, cherry and blackberry and definitely tart. Oh, oh, sorry, Chris. I thought you were telling Andy. Um, so yeah, Marla, those are great call outs. And notice with Marla, she's getting that olive taste. And that is partially because that whole area has olive trees. So definitely. So Marla says vertiginous, it means steep. It's extremely high or steep, causing vertigo. That's where the word comes from, okay? Kind of interesting. So all around and just south of Geneva, all around that area are, is, is the Alps and steep, steep slopes. And so they have to tear, tear everything. They have to hand harvest because the um, mechanical machines can't go up the slopes and um, they harvest it in a, in a certain way. 2018 was an excellent year in Savoie, um, excellent ripeness, excellent depth, um, and this wine was only made in 900 cases. The soil, for those of you who love soil, Lisa Gilbert couldn't join us tonight, but I know she loves to hear about the soil. The soil is limestone, marl, M-A-R-L. I bet you don't know what marl is. It's um, lime-rich mud or mudstone with clay. And then scree, which was rolling rocks, rocks from the cliffs, which can be volcanic. Um, 
and they have a, the steep slopes have a southwest exposure. So um, one month in um, fermenting and then eight months in stainless steel. This is a lot of information you don't need to know, but um, it's all done by hand, as I said before. Okay, so that is the Gerard Madu. He's won all sorts of awards in the last few years. And actually, one of the articles I just pulled up um, was saying it's a great place to visit. His vineyard is one of the top 10. This is an article written by someone in France of the top 10 vineyards to visit. And Gerard Madu's was one of them. Apparently, he puts together a gastronomic feast and serves it in the vineyards. And then he has big parties in the winter, too. So it sounds like a, a wonderful and beautiful place to visit. Okay. So, I didn't pull out my French wine map. All right, here it is. And I need to look at it. So, two weeks ago, we studied Charbonneau, or a month ago, actually, we had Charbonneau. And that was from this area. Okay, here's Switzerland here. And Savoie is here. Okay, so I know you guys can't see that really well. It's, uh, it's opposite my hand. So, that's Savoie. So you can see it's like north of the Rhone. It runs along the Rhone River, but it's north of the region is north of the Rhone and then just just west of Beaujolais. So it's, it is really an up and coming, interesting area. Um, and then this is the region itself, Savoie. That's the region. It looks bigger than it is, right? Okay, because this is a blown up map. All right. And where's Geneva? Geneva is here. So Lyon is, is, it, is the major city in this area. Okay. And I do have soil maps. I'm not showing you. But I will, I will share with you pictures because I like you to have a picture of what the area looks like. Okay. And unfortunately, Facebook doesn't let you, um, doesn't let you put up pictures, as we know. But this is, um, I believe this is Jean... John, um, what is his last name? Oh, oh Jean Charles Gerard Madu in his vineyard. And you can see the extreme slopes, 50 year old vines, and the whole region has very old vines. And here's another picture of the region. Okay, not quite as steep. All right, so and it's, it's its own microclimate. All right, so now let's see, going back to questions. When are we going? I know, Chris. Let's go tomorrow. I'm ready. <laughs> so Marla said hers is very dry. Does the soil you described affect that? Absolutely. That dryness will be affected by the soil. Um, and it's also the winemaking. Okay. Not Jean Valjean. <laughs> All right. So, um, so Savoie. So I showed you pictures of Savoie. Savoie is a picture of a fa of fairy tale perfection, okay? Um, Snow-capped peaks, green rolling hills, wildflowers, and cold sparkling mountain streams. It's a French department in the Auvergne, Auver Auver oh, I can't pronounce it, in the Rhone Alps in Eastern France. One of the largest and most prosperous regions of France. Can anybody guess why? Why is that area so prosperous? And while I'm waiting for your answers, um, the, the different, the three main cities, Lyon, is known for petrochemical and pharma. The Saint Etienne is industrial and Grenoble is actually high tech. All right, so nobody knows why the Rhone Alps, why this area is so pros prosperous. Well, it's home to Chamonix, which is one of the legendary ski, um, ski resorts in the world, Chamonix. Um, and Chris, I would go just for that, just for Chamonix, um, and then drink wine while we're there. Okay, good guess, the mining. And there definitely, I'm sure, is mining. So um, it was created, this AOC, this area, was created in 1973. And um, their um, neighbors, and Lori, you'll get this, but I think for, for Americans who haven't driven around Europe, it's hard to, to fully get that. And I know I talked about my, my trip to France many, many times, but you can drive region to region. You can easily drive to Switzerland and you can drive up over the Alps, which I've never done, but would love to do, to Italy too. So it, um, the neighbors to the east, Switzerland to the east, Jura, which is part of France to the north, um, but right over the Alps re, uh, uh, are the Italian Alps. Okay, so uh, it's under 5,000 acres and only 0.5% of French wines. Chamonix, 
spelled very well, Chris. Yes, very nice. Um, but it's interesting because even though it's in the Alps and it's an alpine climate, it has its own microclimate. And that's partially because the mountains surrounding um, protect the area. And then there's the south facing the sun preserves some of the heat and the warmth. The soil that's there preserves some of the heat and the warmth. And then, um, and then not only that, but then um, uh, the lake, the rivers, the two rivers, the, um, the Rhone, um, and there's another one, which I know, but can't Luar. think of. No. Loire Valley? No, it's Loire Valley. That says Loire. Or is that River Valley? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But, um, and then the Mediterranean coming up as well, because it's just north of Provence. So it's a huge yeah. region. So, um, and mo most of the soils are limestone soils. And 70% um, of the wine that's produced in, um, in the region is, is white. It's actually white. I know, Chris. It's almost like we had, do we have to go to Aruba first? Um, so, and they, they grow, as I mentioned before, olives, but also apricots, figs, and almond trees can share with the vineyards. Okay. So um, other grapes they grow, you know what, there's, there's probably, I don't know, 24 others, some white, some red. Most of them you've never heard of before, but they do have Roussan. I mentioned the Jacquere. Those are both whites. Um, Marsan, Pinot Gris, right? Because they're right near the Rhone. So you're going to find some of those overlapping. And then some others, the Gamay, the Pinot Noir, the Douce Noir, which is the Charbonneau that we had um, a few weeks ago, and um, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot. So there's lots going on there. Um, and Lori goes, uh, will probably be the first of us to have that chance to, to get over there and do some tasting. But um, I have to tell you, I, I served a Charbonneau at a tasting last week and people were lined up for it. It was, it just went, people loved it. It was so different. And I know we tried it a few weeks ago, but if you didn't have a chance to try it, I highly, highly recommend it. Okay. So there's just a few appellations. I'm not even going to go through it. Um, it's an interesting area, right? It was a main communication area. Um, even before the Romans, the Allobroges um, lived there. And then the Romans came through and they loved this grape. Um, the plant yields grapes that um, mature before the frost up in the Alps, and they are able to with, withstand the alpine climate. And so, um, but on the night of November 24th, 1248, this is how far back the history on this wine goes, um, there's a catastrophic mount, landslide on Mont Grenier, which is there. And it, um, the north side of the mountain suddenly collapsed and it buried 16 villages. So they're not, they were never reclaimed, they're underneath, um, and 5,000 people were killed. And so today, the soils, they planted vineyards so that they don't have more landslides there. Um, but just kind of an interesting um, thing that happened in the region. And then um, before it was France, Savoie was part of Italy, part of the Kingdom of Italy. It was annexed to France in 1860. Okay, so Chris says we're going to go Aruba second, France first. I agree. I just can't decide between going to France and going to Italy as soon as I can travel. I can't decide. So um, Savoie is actually known for, so though we're really enjoying this wine, and I'm going to talk about the food pairings um, as well, the Mondus, um, Savoie is known for vermouth. So if, are any of you vermouth, the vermouth enjoyers? That's most what Savoie is known for. Okay, and the vermouth, it, the, that region is very famous. It's an aromatized wine, so it has herbs, spices, barks, flowers, seeds, roots, and other botanicals, but it's fortified with distilled spirits. So it's heavy. It's not a fine, light on your palate wine. It's fortified, so it's big and heavy. And that's believed to be one of the oldest forms of alcohol libation. All right. Um, all right, so I'm going to jump down to, and now it's grown. We talk a lot about where is it grown. All right. Uh, Marla, you're saying that you don't drink uh, vermouth anymore. Yeah. Interesting. And it, it goes in a lot of different drinks. Right. Um, so the regions that it's produced in, it's it is definitely Savoie. I, I don't know if you guys have been playing our drinking game, but definitely Savoie. It's also found in Switzerland, Australia, Argentina, Sicily and the U.S. OK, 
So it makes red wines, it makes rosé wines. They do make sparkling wines there, Cremant, but, um, but not with the Mandus. And it's oftentimes blended with Gamay and Pinot Noir um, to give the dark, a darker color and higher acid levels to the wine to help them age well. Okay, Lori Bailey, this is for you. In Switzerland, the grape is known as Gros Rouge, G-R-O-S, Rouge. Okay. Um, and in 19th century, it was the most planted red grape variety along the shores of Lake Geneva, but it's had difficulty. Phylloxera wiped it out. And so um, it wasn't, um, it, 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 it came back, but it's made it only a small comeback, even though some algae like it and it's hard to find. So this begs a question, right? I have all these facts about Savoie, but really what is it in it for you? What is, what is in this, these wines for you? Yes, definitely the bottle. <laughs> Leslie, is that the vermouth that's going fast? Um, so what is in this for you? What, is, what does this all mean? Well, there are the noble grape varieties, which are the most famous grape varietals. And we get, you know, you get an idea of price point depending on where they're from. We've done a lot of talking about that. But something like this Mandus is really special because it's, it's still a fine wine, it's, but it's small batch and not a lot of people know about it. And I guarantee that if you serve this at a party to people who didn't know wine, they would really enjoy it. They would be surprised. And if it was a food party, it would go with a lot of the foods. All right, so let's segue into that and then we'll go back to regions. All right, um, so we always talk about food pairings, right? in terms of looking at what the locals are eating and how the food that surrounds them compares to the grapes that grow best around them. So did any of you, did any of you have any really good food pairings with this wine? Because what do they eat in Savoie? What do they eat? Definitely. All right, I'm trying a, a cheese with it, a Havarti dill. Oh, that's good. Wow. That really brings out the salinity in it, but it picks up on the dill. That's really interesting. And then I have a truffle cheddar as well. Apparently my husband does not like my choice in cheeses tonight. Okay. Chris had some stinky French brie. Chris, tell us, how was it? Yeah, Andrew Poplin. Interesting. Andrew Poplin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So here's my wow. The truffle, wow. That truffle cheese, it's a truffle cheddar. And when I had it and drank the wine with it, it brought out the nuttiness and like a really cool kind of sweet flavor in it. It was really interesting. So what, what the locals eat is cheese and potatoes. Okay, so if you had like a, a no gratin something, that is supposed to go great with the local <laughs> wines. Marla had, okay, wait. Leslie had salt and pepper breadsticks. So that would be interesting to see how that is. That's gonna be more of a pure reflection of the wine and the salt, of course, will go well with it. Marla had basil, basic grilled chicken, yep. Yeah, and Chris likes the truffle cheddar. It was so good from Trader Joe's. Um, the brie may, because the brie is so creamy, that may block your taste buds. And so you may not experience the wine in the same way. And the camembert would have would bring out like a different kind of um, earthy quality. So fondue sav uh, savoyard, I'm not pronouncing that right, sav savoyard, contains cheeses from all over the Rhone Alps. So those are typically Beaufort, Comte, Comte, and Tom de, Swa de uh, Savoie. Sure, so those are all local cheeses there. They eat rabbit, veal, sausages, and stew. Um, other cheeses, um, they're cow milk cheeses, Rebel Blachon, um, but um, definitely the Beaufort and, and Comte. They have a dish called Tartiflette. Has anybody ever had Tartiflette? It's a gratin made with bacon that pairs well with the wine's red, deep fruit flavors. That sounds really good. Yeah, really good. Um, and then um, from Chamonix Mont Blanc, they typically have, um, as I said, they have the, the cheeses and the potatoes because they're easy to store during the long winter months and they have a high calorie value. So they make for good human fuel source. So that really is, I mean, it's really up in the Alps. 
Recommended labels, some of the top labels, of course, the Gerard Madou, uh, Char Charles Chosset, Dominique Belward, and Domain du Pasquier. Du Pasquier. Um, Marla, if you want to put the name of the wine you're drinking, she's loving that. Okay. So for the regions, so the areas, again, I said Switzerland, Australia, Argentina, Sicily, and the U.S. So in the U.S., it's a kind of an interesting story. It was fairly common in the 1800s, but most of the old vines, as we hear oftentimes in the U.S., were, or were ripped out. But what happened is when they brought over the mandus, they mixed it somehow with the Italian wine grape, Rafosco del Pon Peducolo Rosso, okay? And so it was mixed with that, with that Italian grape for a while, and they call it Rafosco. They were mixed on that versus the mandus, like they really thought they were the same thing until 2008. That's how crazy, like the DNA markings, the, all of that, it had been since 2008 that they were mixed. So it's hard to get a count in California of how much mandus they truly have because they have uh, Rafalsco as well and they, they're just kind of pulling out the differences, but definitely there's not a lot, okay? In Australia, the vines are 100 um, plus years old and they date back to around 1907, so 110, um, but it's often co-fermented with Syrah and Cab, Cabernet Sauvignon. So, um, <laughs> so we, we've had a little bit of a hard time in the US, but there's some made or grown in the Central Coast, some in El Dorado, some in Santa Cruz Mountains, some in the Santa Maria Valley, um, as well as the Southern Oregon AVA of the Rogue Valley and the Umpqua Valley AVA. Okay, and so they have to, you have to be really careful when you're making mandus because there's high acid, high tannin. So if you're not careful, it can be really, really bold and so strong that it's not palatable. So they leave many grapes as whole clusters when they make it so that it can all ferment together. Um, and then a lot of times they'll put it into neutral oak barrels for aging. A lot of French winemakers d do use oak um, to help mellow the tannins. All right, so Savoy, I've said that 16 times. Anybody else find a good pairing for it? Um, the grandparent to Mandus, or the ha or it's a half sibling, they haven't figured it out, to, is Syrah. So there is a, a derivation there. Okay. And a lot of times they'll green harvest, which means that they'll go through and they'll pull off grapes because it's so robust. They'll harvest the green grapes um, and leave some extra, leave some there to continue to grow and develop. And we've talked about that before, but that allows those grapes that are there to be much more robust and concentrated. Okay. Um, and it thrives best on stony vineyard soils that have high limestone and clay. All right. Now, I had mentioned to you that the Gamay, I was going for Gamay, which is Beaujolais. Well, the grape is Gamay. The wine is from the Beaujolais region, so you call it Beaujolais. And um, that is a fun one. That's an early drinking. Beaujolais Nouveau is to drink now. A lot of it doesn't make it here except for um, like high volume Beaujolais Nouveaus. But the difference is um, for Gamay, people say if you're the one who stops to smell the neighbor's flowers or your own or breathes in deeply when you're in a forested area, so you love those aromatics, then Gamay would be perfect for you. It's a light bodied red, similar to this one, but it's more, it's similar also to Pinot Noir because it's actually, this one is black and red fruits, red plum, black plum. We said that earlier, red cherry, black cherry. Gamay is really red, red berry, red cherry. And that's what Pinot Noir is as well. Strawberry, okay, red, think of red fruits, red currant, not black currant. And so um, Gamay is a cousin of Pinot Noir and it grows, as we said, ne um, next to Burgundy. Okay, so delicate for, um, floral aromas, subtle earthy notes, um, and a, a Gamay also has a surprising ability to pair with food, even fish. Okay, and you can find high quality Gamay um, at better prices than Pinot Noir. So it's a better um, QPR, um, better cost per quality. Okay. Um, Found in France, Canada, Switzerland, Oregon, and New Zealand. And Gamay, my video paused again. Um, Gamay has um, it, its aromas of fresh cut violets, iris, peony flowers, 
Okay, so you're going to see some similarities just in the descriptors that I'm using. High volume equals common and cheap. Almost always, Chris. And the reason is because when you're making wines to be high volume, you're, you're making them for a lot of people. And so they have to be consistent. And a lot of times, yes, the truffle cheddar is Trader Joe's. A lot of times, um, if you're making it in volume, you're, you're growing mass grapes, right? So they're not going through and pruning out some of the grapes to make the ones that are there um, stand out and more concentrated. They're growing as much as they possibly can in a certain area, right? So that's why, that's one of the reasons that volume wines are cheaper it's not just the commonality it's that if they're high volume they're made to be um, less expensive they're not usually handcrafted the winemaker knows they are making it not as an artistry although i guess an artistry is to reproduce but to make it the same taste year after year okay so great question all right um and so um it said violet iris, iris peony flowers, cherry, raspberry, and plum, and subtle subtle notes of potting soil and earth. Oh, I would love some truffle French fries right now, Leslie. That sounds so good. So I have truffle salt from the salt cellar in Portland. It's amazing. It's so good. Um, so there's also in Gamay black currant, raspberry, violet, and then there's banana, or as I said, bubble gum. And that's because of the way that it's made. It's a certain, um, it's a certain way of, of car with carbonic uh, maceration. It's a certain way of making these, um, these, these gamets that can have even more aromatics. Okay. Um, and um, Chanas is the one area, the village in Beaujolais that makes a, a medium bold aromas of rose, peony, and spice, and woodsy notes, and it's like the best gamay, absolutely the best. Okay, so let's see. We have 10 minutes left. I don't think I've ever gotten through all my notes before. One thing I wanted to share with you, but if you have any, <laughs> Chris, Chris says just stick a whole truffle in my mouth. I One of the places I really wanna go is this, um, it's not a chateau, and I'm gonna I'm gonna have a hard time thinking of the name. But um, in Italy, um, in Tuscany, um, there's a place I want to run a tour to. But we, they do truffle hunting, so they have a pig that you go out with and dogs, and you go out into their forest and you hunt truffles, and you come back, and their chef, along with you, if you want to, will help make Isn't the dinner. Is that what they do to make to fool somebody into doing something? <laughs> Yes, you certainly can go there. Like agro-tourism agro was becoming really, really big in Europe um, up until coronavirus. And that was people traveling to farms and ranches and places where they could harvest their own food and make their own meals. And so, as Keith said, isn't that just a way to get them to make their own food? <laughs> it definitely is, but under the tutelage of a chef. So you're learning as you're cooking and as you're doing. So that sounds amazing i love truffle i know some of you do not like truffle um and truffle definitely tastes better or different than mushrooms in general right so mushrooms in general like a cooked mushroom has more of an earthier almost a salinity to it that we call umami and there are taste qualities like that throughout foods that you um eat and within wine as well Truffle is like, it's just so much more intense. If you've never had it, I highly recommend it. If you go to a salt or an olive oil store, oftentimes they'll have truffle oil um, and truffle salt, which is so, just so good. So, and Trader Joe's often has truffle cheddar. All right. So I did want to share with you the flower aromas because people ask me about this a lot. My cards, I have... Um, rose which i'm not seeing right off the top of my head but it's a picture of a rose and you can have rose a rose smell or taste in your wine and so a lot of times Gewürztraminer will have rose gamay pinot noir grenache sangiovese and nebbiolo can all have rose um, geranium you can pick up geranium as a smell or a taste quality citrus blossom white flowers have you guys ever heard people say well there's a white flower note in this and oftentimes that's in Tarantes, Muscadet, which I may do um, in the fall. Uh, Pinot Grigio can have white flowers in it. And Semillon can also have that essence of white flowers, like lily. If you can imagine what a lily smells like 
or what it might feel like if you're torn up and put it into the wine, right? So Lily, lavender. And we talk about lavender a lot. A lot of the wines that we've had have lavender in them. So Grenache, Syrah, Mouved, Petit Verdot, Tempranillo, and Sangiovese have lavender. And then Violet. So Mouved, which we, we I don't think we've tasted that together, but we've had it in the GSM. Um, Torrigo National, Petit Verdot, Malbec, and Merlot all have Violet. And so it's hard to imagine, unless you have those flowers and can kind of tear one up. Let's see, what do I have here? I have a rose. It's a red rose. Okay, I took a piece off of my red rose. Okay. Oh, it smells like truffle because I have truffle on my hands. <laughs> but I can smell that rose. Okay, so now I'm going to go and smell my wine and I really don't pick it up. Okay, so now I really want to get a sense of what rose might smell like. And if I had a wine that I didn't mind wasting a little bit, I would actually drop, you can muddle these, I would drop it into the wine. But the rose smell is so much stronger now. And then I would go back and smell, see if I can smell the, the, the um, rose in there. There's clearly no rose. I still get the violet. I actually got a little bit of pine. I don't know if you guys have, have gotten the pine. It might be a little bit of cedar. As we said, a lot of these are oaked. So you might get toast or smoke. Does anybody get toast or smoke? <laughs> Leslie and Chris can't stop thinking about truffle fries. You guys are gonna have to, you're gonna have to have those tonight or this weekend. Okay, so I'm not getting pine. Nope, not getting it, but I did get the nuttiness. All right, so that's that's kind of my lesson for the night. So unless you have any questions, I, Marla's not getting pine. And I would almost call it, it probably is, is more like a cedar. And yes, Leslie, <laughs> Leslie, you're killing me. Truffle cheddar fries with bacon bits. That sounds amazing. Are we having that tonight? We haven't eaten yet. <laughs> that does sound amazing. What else? Where Do you think you guys would be <laughs> would be comfortable ordering mandus at a restaurant? What do you think? What would you have it with if you ordered it? I might even do like a smoked salmon would be really good. All right. So thank you all so much for your participation. Um, I had a great time seeing all of you. And as I say, every week, Keith and I really enjoy that you take some time to spend this time with us and with me and learning about wines. And I know that there's lots of other things that you could spend your time on. So it means so much. Thank you very much. Um, check out my website when you have a chance at artisanwinetasting.com and I'll definitely post once I have that second version of my card game up. But um, you're welcome, Mar. Thank you. Um, there are um, on YouTube, there are tutorials on using the card game as well. So um, you know what, Chris, I can't remember what's next. It's on the website. Um, I'll have to post it after this. I was trying to remember it before tonight, um, but I think, I think it's two. I think it's a double. Um, what do you have left, Chris? What do you have left? <laughs> Tell us what you have left. Um, I will definitely post it. Um, so, yeah. Thank you all very much. Have a great two weeks, and we'll see you soon. Bye.